Good evening, everybody. Hello. <laughs> uh, welcome to the Frontline Club, and thank you for coming on this uh, beautiful spring evening. Um, in a moment, I'm going to hand you over to Steve Corshaw from Amnesty International, who's going to chair tonight's discussion. Um, before I do that, if I can ask you to switch your phones to silent. And uh, when it comes to questions, if you can wait for the microphone, because we are broadcasting live. And of course, if everybody remembers to pick up a book of Serge's book at the end uh, of the event. So over to Steve. Thanks very much indeed. And yes, my microphone is working. Thank you um, for that. Um, I'm Steve Crawshaw. I'm very honoured to be sitting here with uh, the executive director of, it's much easier to remember the acronym, CANVAS, and I will always get lost, Centre for Advocacy, Nonviolent Actions and Strategies. F. Whatever. <laughs> nonviolent, the king of nonviolence um, around the world. Um, so Sergio is now head of Canvas based in Belgrade, which does lots of fascinating things, which he will uh, be talking about in a moment. The way that he came to that role was through a leading role in Otpor, the quite amazing Serb uh, student and uh, much more than student and youth group. It became the crucial group for all of Serbia in bringing an end to the rule of Slobodan Milosevic which I then as a journalist, now working for Amnesty International, but then as a journalist witnessed over the years and years and years, it seemed impossible for Milosevic ever to go. And I'm hoping that Sergio will tell us uh, of, of how that actually happened. And uh, we are here to uh, celebrate the book that's already been mentioned that you're already aware of, Blueprint for Revolution, and the most wonderfully long title in, in history, How to Use Rice Pudding, Lego Men, and Other Nonviolent Techniques to Galvanize Communities, Overthrow Dictators, or Simply Change the World. So quite a simple title, really, isn't it? That's really. Um, <laughs> tell us a little bit about what the thinking is. We'll go back into the past in a moment, but tell us a little bit about your favourite, what drove you to write the book, what was most enjoyable about writing the book, and what would you like people most to take away from the book? Well, it's not the subtitle. <laughs> I mean, the, the most enjoyable thing is like, uh, I'm not a writer, I'm not a person like you or, or John Jackson sitting here, and that's like, uh, you guys were wrote a great book called Small Acts of Resistance, so I got jealous and I wanted to beat you. <laughs> well, this is a fake story, okay. <laughs> we'll go now to the, to the real story. Uh, there are so many fascinating stories you learn when you work with activists across the world. And one of the things you really, you really feel is how this revolution, the first thing, is happening in your head. So this is not like, you know, it's like people imagine these revolutionaries as heroes, Che Guevara's of this world and stuff like that. And hanging out with them, which is the privilege, you understand that a lot of them are people like you and me. They're all coming from this kind of Hobbit background. And uh, telling these simple stories and telling how the first revolution really happens in your head, and then going down to the really common people and hanging out with common people was the funniest part. Plus the research is great. I mean, uh, learning about the funny things like the toy protests in Russia, and you know how the Maldivians were building their communities based on you know bringing people on the beaches and building around the, the things like rice pudding. This is not how people are imagining this revolution. We are super obsessed with the pictures we get on the TV. Tell us one or two stories about the ones that you think of as well, it's like the, 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 the We were super proud. One of the things which happens in the book is that you reinvent the tactics. And of course, you know, we try to put this in a structured way and say it's like a the way you build these tactics is you think what you're going to achieve, how you're going to recruit the people. But basically, it's the people creativity, which you can't really predict. So it's like uh, back there in the 90s, we were opposing Milosevic. It's like it was 15 of us. And I think we had a budget of like seven pounds. So we were sitting in a coffee shop and thinking, what can be the mockery we can do? And because we were super obsessed with Monty Python and not being politically correct and being really kind of, of tough, we came out with this big petrol barrel and we painted Milosevic face on it. And there was a hole on it and a baseball bat. So we would invite downtown shoppers to come there, put the coin like in a flipper, and you buy yourself a right to boom, to hit the face. Okay, so we just removed and see what is going. We didn't know if it's going to work, really. And then, you know, within the matter of minutes, there was a line of the people, you know, trying to be the guy. It's like, that was not the funniest part. The part that you can't expect is what happened when the police so what they are going to do, arrest us, we are nowhere to be seen, arrest the downtown shoppers and charge them for what? So they ended up arresting the barrel. 
So the photography of the police people drawing barrel to the police car was probably the best day for photojournalists in my country. And you know, just a few years after that, you see the same thing happening somewhere else. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, Barno, Russia, people are protesting Putin's disputed elections. So of course they can't protest, but their toys can. So they build a little Lego town and they come out with the Lego cars and they are all wearing a little transparent saying, you know, 120% for Putin. You know, give us free and fair elections. And the funny thing is that this police is there and everybody is taping. So, you know, it's like it goes viral, the people are having fun, nobody gets arrested. And then somebody sees this in Kremlin. And now the phone rings from the police chief in Barnaul, Siberia, which is the place I can't really find on the map. And next thing you know, they publish the piece of ban. And they say there can't be a protest of 100 legal people because they are not citizens of Russia. <laughs> now, I would die to have this piece framed on my wall because that shows how the creativity always win over the power. And you know, getting into the people and listening to this type of stories was, I think, the, the most funny part of the book. Because hanging out with the people who are, you know, troublemakers and would love to risk their life, not for their own sake, but for the sake of the kids, really, you know, it gives you this feeling that you're back in your 20s and the activist and everything, and I'm 42 now, so I really need that kind of <laughs> activist fix. <laughs> You came up with this great word, um, laughtivism, of activists and mischief together. And as you said, so um, John Jackson, who's here this evening, and I wrote a book together, which actually that was how we first met. Sure, sure, which sure. I gather the club has very kindly put us oh, copies there. Enough already. Uh, we're talking about this book this evening. But uh, the way we met, apart from very briefly in Belgrade, was through a lovely <laughs> phrase that, that you said of, if you are beating me and at you, then you are the loser. Basically. You are the loser, yes. And that, in a sense, is, is the theme of the, those couple of stories that you've told. But what you always hear, of course, from people as well is like, Serbia was actually very difficult to get rid of Milosevic. He was there for a decade and, and protests kept failing and, and failing mm. and failing. Um, and there was a 1996 97 where it almost worked and they all argued with each other mm. and it fell apart and so on. But you now, your work is involved with going around the world, if you like preaching the wonders of nonviolence and working with others. But you must get people saying, Serbia was like easy, my place is difficult. They're right, aren't they? I mean, of Serbia at work, you've just told Russia, Putin doesn't look as though he's any weaker than he was mm. um, before. Um, and not to mention the kind of the Syria. horrors of what we're mm. seeing in Syria. So kind of how do you, how, what's it like working with activists who are risking their lives, as in some senses you mm -hmm. were, you were certainly risking being beaten and, and, mm -hmm. and possibly death as well, uh, and you were regularly beaten and, and, and arrested. But how do you confront the idea that nonviolence is easy for the, quote, soft ones, but not for mm -hmm. the tough stuff? Well, first of all, it's like the, 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 it, this is the very reason why the first chapter in the book is called, this will never happen here. Because this is exactly the first thing you hear, whether this will never go, going to happen here because the Syrian regime is too oppressive, or this will never happen in UK because the people are too busy buying in shops and don't care too much for the politics. There is always reason why it can't happen here and why somewhere else was easier. And I think the, the particularly, they're right. Uh, there is no such thing as a copy-paste and every single context is different. And having the idea that, you know, it's like, uh, even the name of the book is kind of cynical, there is no such thing as a blueprint for the revolution. You can't really say, okay, this is how you're going to do it. Because, you know, for this type of stuff, you need a vision and people need to dream their own country in 10 to 15 years. And you need the creativity and you need numbers. And you can't really borrow this from somebody. But what we're talking about is a set of tools which are the same. You need to understand that you will never win without having unity. And whether we are talking the political unity in Serbia, which was so hard to, to achieve, and 96, 97, we were so happy, you know, teasing Milosevic for three months. And then the damn opposition parties, they fell apart after two months. They were start fighting each other. And then the whole momentum was lost. Or you look at the, we have a Sunni people and the Kurdish people and the Christian people and the Alawite people. And without really bringing on the different confessions together, you can't really build a movement planning and of course we can discuss this later but I, I often tend to say the the sad story about this kind of stuff is that people really think that this is all spontaneous there are like two types of nonviolent revolutions they are either spontaneous or successful you can't get both 
And it was not because the, the Gandhian struggle was continuous, but because Gandhi was a great strategist. And you know, there were so many different cases. And yes, planning is boring. It's far more boring to get into this strategy and kind of stuff. And last but not the least importance, uh, there is this holy principle of nonviolent discipline. Because one single group of five idiots from an organization like Black Bloc can really spoil your demonstration of 100,000 people protesting peacefully. And uh, yes, it's boring to think about the details like this, but at the end of the day, when you have 100,000 people in a peaceful march and then have a one person throwing a molotov at the police, I'll tell you who is on the tomorrow page of The Guardian, that crazy guy. Because, you know, we have the situation in which all of these principles are existing and we are looking at the situation where we also learn. Because, you know, every time the new group came in, was back there in 2000, we were so excited. We had text messages. We could text message 20,000 text messages calling people to go on the election. Wow! And they can use their phones. Well, you know, guess what? The Facebook is far more effective. You know, every single generation of the activists brings something new, and it would be really irresponsible to say, oh, yes, we know how these silence work. We don't know, but the beauty of it is that everybody <laughs> is learning. But whether we are talking about the Syria or, you know, uh, climate change march in New York, the principles are the same, and we want to look at these principles and see if we can find the easy language, not really boring, not really academic. I often say this is a subway book. We don't do footnotes, we do something you can read on the subway. A very entertaining book, I have to say. A great, it, is a, it is a great read. Um, and it's really interesting because it's partly literally a how-to. It's kind of literally encouraging activists go out there, but for observers and people, it's also about what people can take, take away with them themselves. Um, but are you saying then, so going back to Syria, mm. that they, I mean, which as we all know, started with overwhelmingly non-violent protests. I mean, then there was a little bit of violence and people picked up some guns, but basically it started very much. And so the violence came from despair at other things not working. So are you saying if they'd stuck to non-violence, then he'd have waved goodbye in, in the same way? Or what's, what's your argument? What, what would have your counsel, what was your counsel? Because I know you worked with Syrian activists. Can you maybe tell a story or two from that? Well, I mean, um, But what do you take away from the fact that things are looking so bleak now mm -hmm. and it's very hard to see ways back from where we are? Well, I mean, first of all, we need to, f if we are, if we are uh, media observers and we are looking at it as a, as a learning curve, uh, there is a learning curve in Arab Spring, which was good, and there is a learning curve in Arab Spring, which was completely wrong. And unfortunately, Syria is on the end of the learning curve, which is wrong. I will try to make it really, really simple. Tunisians came out really nonviolently, really disciplined. They, they m mobilized the pillars of support. They persuaded the army. They dismantled Ben Ali. Weeks. Egyptians were so super excited and uh, super jealous that the smaller brother, the Tunisians, really done it before them. So they came out in it what looked like a nonviolent blitzkrieg, ended up with one of the worst dictators in the world. Even if this guy was heavily supported by the West, that doesn't really matter. They, they kick him out. And now the Bahrainis took it from there. But the Bahraini government, they say, okay, it is this Mubarak was too soft. So if we go after our demonstrators, and Bahrain had the biggest number of demonstrators per capita, it's a very small society, and this is Shia people protesting against the Sunni minority in the government, and they invited Saudi army, and Saudi army smacked them down. And because there is a fifth fleet there, you know, the West turned the blind eye, so we don't really follow the news from the Bahrain, but Gaddafi did. And he watched the news and said, oh, I'm going to learn something from these guys because, you know, if the people go out on the street, you go, go and kill them by, by tanks. Mm -hmm. This is how it is going to work. Well, he did. And, mm -hmm. I mean, he used the military against the protesters. And then, uh, then there was this wrong side of the learning curve because people thought that, you know, the violence is faster and then somebody will come in there safe. So the Libyans took gun. And it was because Sarkozy was losing elections that, you know, the French was leading the intervention. And then the Syrians who were protesting peacefully for seven months have turned their TV on and seen Gaddafi killed and raped in a violent uprising. And they say, wow, we want this for Assad. Let's take guns. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, when you're looking at the process, nobody was really looking at the numbers. And the numbers are quite stunning. Uh, there is more scientific book by two American scholars, which will tell you that out of the 323 different struggles in last century, 52% of nonviolent struggles were, were effective, as opposed to 26% of the violent struggle. 
And when you look at democracy stability prospects, your prospects for democracy and stability with Libyan scenario, which is the violent uprising, or Afghanistan scenario, or Iraqi scenario, are 4%, as compared to 42% of the Egyptian scenario. So there is a scientific way, and there is a, there is a learning curve way. But activist to activist way, speaking with these people, they just thought, the, you know, this is not going to work. They were desperate. They were looking at what others were doing. And they have this violent history of the situation. And there is a chapter in the book where we try to explain this to them. And simply speaking, you want to go back to Sun Tzu. And because Sun Tzu said, you know, you want to win in the, in the war, you want to put your strong points against your opponent's weak points. Uh, uh, Bashir al-Assad is running the third strongest military in the Middle East. Having a clue that you can defeat him in the military battlefield is equally uh, crazy as, you know, going to Mike Tyson and challenging him in the boxing ring. Would you really box with Mike Tyson? No, you won't, because the guy will eat your ear first, then he's going to eat you alive. What about playing chess with Mike Tyson? What about playing economy or economic boycott? So the very similar case was South Africa. And it was really, really the place where you had this very successful nonviolent movement, which worked with ANC, and then they turned into the spear of the nation, which was their pathetic attempt to challenge the strongest African military at that time with bombs and Molotovs. And then they figure it out that what they really need to do to get rid of Boda's government is to bankrupt it. And they bankrupt it by, by a consumer's boycott. So it's like there were cases in the past where movement went into the wrong path. And when they came back, unfortunately, it's, it's very difficult to see any kind of positive prospect in Syria while we are talking now. But the good news is that we are meeting the people who are still fighting ISIS with nonviolent struggle and with humor. And they do tremendous stuff uh, destroying this narrative about ISIS being cool and in, and actually doing the really, really hilarious stuff on the YouTube with mocking them. So I mean, the spirit of even that is very still there. Even in very, and I mean, yes, they can, very, they can very lose heads very, very like this. You referenced an important book there, which I think is really interesting. I mean, that book you mentioned by Erica Chenoweth and, yes, and Marie why, Stefan. Why What's also interesting, works. if I remember rightly, about the starting point of that book, that one of those started as a massive skeptic Absolutely. and was challenged, Erica, saying, yes. she said, well, you've kind of cherry picked the figures. And they said, go and look at the figures then and see what you came, come up with. And she said, well, I will. I'll just prove you wrong. And went off and discovered exactly the opposite, which was, kind of, which was a very interesting takeaway from that. Now, you talk very interesting, so what you did in, in Serbia was, was fascinating, but of course it, um, it also got attacked at the time, at the time maybe the regime, but afterwards there was talk, you know, you'd gone off, you and others had gone off for a little huddle into the Intercontinental in Budapest or somewhere mm. like that, where it was like invited to the safety of that, and there were American advisors, including, um, I can't remember if Gene Sharp's lot were involved with that, anyway, there were, mm. there were Americans involved with that. And you were then described as a kind of the whole thing was a, a foreign conspiracy that had made it happen. You were the, it's always a the paid or unpaid yes. puppet, as it were. Uh, and interestingly, that history has slightly repeated itself that always. you guys then travel the world. And with Egypt, there were bases which talked about us had, had mm -hmm. played in, in, uh, in working with people and talking through the ideas which you explore in the book and you explore at Canvas. And again, there were big pieces saying actually it was all kind of strings were being pulled from somewhere else. Can you talk about what it felt like at the time? I assume that you pay tribute to the people who were helping you, but mm -hmm. first what it felt like on the receiving side, mm -hmm. uh, and then what it felt like on the giving and sharing advice side, mm -hmm. and the two broadly similar sets of accusations that came out both. And if you've got room for a little tweak into that answer as well, um, there's a story which uh, I think you haven't really told publicly very much, but, but I enjoy very much if I remember it rightly. The very, very famous slogan, which some of you in the room may know from the Bolshevik era, mm. was, he is finished, Gotov year, he, mm. he is finished. And it was absolutely everywhere on the streets of Belgrade at the time, I remember. And it feels to me that had one of those small moments of magic of just how that happened. So mm. broadly, tell us about Okay. Outside influences, inside influences, and how change really happens. Okay. So, so first of all, it's really interesting how, how I mean, uh, doing it in Serbia was a kind of evolution. And this is where you go all the way from a street thug and drunk, which is how the foreign, the state TV is going to, you know, portray you. And then because we were marching under the flags of, you know, UK and America and stuff like that, and 
wasn't really thinking that a war with NATO was a good idea. We were, of course, the foreign mercenaries and the powers of like that. And we ended up being a terrorist. Uh, OTPOR as a youth movement was officially proclaimed to be a terrorist organization, which was the day when around 10,000 people joined the movement because it was so ridiculous. But what you are going to do is like when you're looking at the labels that you know activists everywhere in the world are going through, you can surprisingly find that the list of the labels for people like Assad or Mubarak is growing very thin because they are thugs and they are terrorists and they are you know foreign puppets. And uh, there is a need from you know regimes to portray you as you know because it's all based on a social distance. And if people perceive you as a kids from the neighborhood, which you basically are, then they may join. And if the people portray you as a terrorist, then they may be not join. And you know, from the giving side, you can look at now and see, especially it was in 2003, 2004, basically the very label of the color revolution, which was invented by Russian state TV, mm -hmm. has this very, very strange narrative that all you need to do is to put the two Serbs in a plane, give them about one million pounds, kick them out to the country X, and boom, next thing you know, there is a million people protesting on the street, and the government falls down. Uh, there is one problem with this narrative, it's not true. If it would be true, I would be the happiest person in the world, because all would be a two or three years, several millions of pounds, and we will turn the world into the, the long-standing democracy. Uh, no, you can't really do that from the outside, and the first lecture we, we do through the, this will never happen here, we try to tell these people we work with that the worst thing they can do is taking foreign advice. Because uh, we had a lot of these foreign experts coming in and out in Serbia, and we learned that basically the expert is a son of a bitch with a fancy suitcase from out of town. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That works for us as well. So don't listen to the foreigners. Foreigners can't really tell you what to do because you know the mentality of the people and you need to have the vision of tomorrow and you have a movement which needs to be the homegrown and the humor and creativity cannot really be imported. The only thing that you can provide these people with are tools. The good news is available online in five to ten years everywhere so you can really you know, bring them down the way how do you play this song on YouTube. So somebody shows you the chords and then you can really play it. Well, bad in my case. If you're John Jackson, you play it better. But then, but then, but then you, you can learn this kind of stuff. But what is really interesting is behind this, and one of the reasons why we really wrote this book, is that behind all of these stories is that this crazy idea that there are powerful entities somewhere in the world which can make the popular revolutions happen. Uh, I've been through one popular revolution, the powerful entities from above, abroad, including UK government and the US government, they couldn't find their nose, not to use uh, some other language. They had this crazy idea that bombing Serbs will really help. And that was the worst idea in the world. And, and it was, aside of killing 4.5 thousand people, it only made Milosevic stronger. So outsiders don't know stuff, and if they try to figure how to realize, it's still not exportable and importable. But what all of these people share in common, the people who look at these conspiracy theory narratives, they don't see a hobbit in the middle of the story. And it's always the Hobbit. It's always the guy from your neighborhood. You know, it's like when we were talking about this Serbian campaign, uh, there were days when our, our secret files were open. And I proudly understood two years after the revolution that I earned myself 178 pages, that's a lot, of the secret police file. And they put you in a room, they put a the police person next to you, and of course you can see it. You can't take it out, you can't publish it, but you can see it. This is where we realized that it was Milosevic's secret police who was searching for my movement, uh, Mastermind, in Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. Which is why this idea was so stupid, because it was in the living room of my parents. So <laughs> they were looking at the campaign headquarters across the sea, and they kind of became a victims of their own propaganda. Yeah and couldn't see the thing which was happening under their chair. So when the same accusation was that, that's a very vivid illustration of it, um, that they were genuinely misled, as it were, thinking there was something there, or they misled themselves, to be exact. So when it, the same accusation was made on the Egyptian, and I guess other stuff, I'm most aware of it on the Egyptian. Um, oh, Egyptian, uh, the, the Turks, of, Russians. Um, did you feel 
indignant? Did you feel hurt? Did you and the Egyptian activists or other activists you're working, did you just kind of laugh at the craziness of the world? How do you perceive it? Because it's a kind of, it's a little subtext that continues basically with the idea of this string pulling from elsewhere. Yeah, there will be more. And now it evolved. It used to be accusing you for the things you've done. And now, you know, you can go to Turkey and see that Erdogan was super obsessed with the this is happening Serbian way. We've never touched one single Turkish activist. But he was so happy to portray this as an export, import. And I think that's, that's one of the things is trying to, you know, prevent their people to go to learn this kind of stuff. Another one is because it's so much easier for the governments to believe that it's a world conspiracy, mm -hmm. not that the, their own citizens are pissed on them mm -hmm. by any means, or capable to organize in thousands, which is their kind of worst nightmare. So it's like on one hand, this is something we live with. On another hand, it's something it's like we, we, when, when you work with, uh, with the groups from, from, from these countries, you tell them this is going to happen. First, you're going to be thugs. Then you're going to be foreign mercenaries. Then you're going to be terrorists at the end. And, you know, so in some cases, it, it really hurts you in the terms of the, you know, Egyptians can go to court and some of them got trialed. And this is the reason why, why this book is committed in part to the guy called Mohammed Adel is because he sits in jail now and he'll be there for three more years. So some of these people are taking tremendous risks yeah. Yeah. In, in using this knowledge. And I know we know the people in Iran who went only for having in their possession our literature, the people we never met. Mm -hmm. They downloaded it, they printed it, they ended up yeah. on the court. So it's like, a, in some cases, for me it can be fun, but for these people, it's not fun. They are, they are, they are having tremendous risk. Sure. Nevertheless, they, they, are, they are ready to take this risk. Yeah, as of course you, you and your colleagues did yourselves. Is the book, in, I know it's coming out in lots of translations, is it going to be translated into Arabic? Is that one of the ones that's coming out? Uh, we are talking about okay. probably translating yeah, it into great. Arabic. The funniest language up to now is Korean. And mm -hmm. that's, there is a growing population of North Koreans who are trying to smuggle stuff in oh. the South Korea. And you know, you can find uh, certain movies and stuff in USBs right. there, so we'll see if yeah. we get on USB. Right. Right. That right. would be a right. Medal right. of Honor. I feel honored to be slightly in your, the category of, of the string pullers that a couple of years, kind of before Otbor existed. I showed you that, but I can't remember if I told you the story that went with it. So there were these big winter protests a couple of years before Otbor existed, where I guess you were also on the streets in that, in 96, 97. And I wrote a piece which, not nearly as eloquently as, as Sergio has done it, but started to explore from observation what people were doing uh, in order to be successful. And it's called 10 Simple Steps for the People to Take. And I thought nothing more about it. It appeared in the Independent. And um, that evening, I switched on the Serb TV news. And as far as I remember, more or less the lead item, anyway, high on the news was the double page spread in the Independent with the headline and everything else. And the announcer solemnly disproved that the whole thing was being run by of London. Uh, so that was kind Isn't of quite, I thought, no, I was actually observing and describing. Um, but no, I was the person who was uh, making it all happen. So glad to, to claim it. Thank you for that. Exactly. Yeah, without that, we none, couldn't without, do it without, without describing, none of, exactly, none of it would happen without the uh, independent. And far more people, of course, this is pre-internet days. So no one would even have known about it if it hadn't been shown. Um, so we've seen a lot of, of the things happening now. You have a, a very um, technical uh, phrase in the book, technical description of um, a dude who knew how to get shit done. Um, tell us what it was about Gandhi that was, uh, what was the difference between the getting the shit done and not getting the shit done? What was, what's the single lesson out of the Gandhi stuff? I mean, there's the obvious, it, it appears to be just, he stood there and did nonviolent stuff. What was it beyond that that actually made it work? I think the, the Gandhi was, well, Gandhi and Pierre Gabriel are two very important people in my life. Uh, Pierre Gabriel, because of the Biko song, was my connection between rock, which was my thing, and the activism, which was for me the thing for all grannies who are standing for dog rights. And I think he made this bridge great. And because in Tito's Yugoslavia, and once you go out, go down to this beautiful club, there is a little red star on the ward. That's the flag of the country my wife, Masha, and me grew up, Yugoslavia. So Yugoslavia, because of its connection with India, was really big on mm -hmm. And we probably learned on, on Gandhi far more than we did on, on some other stuff in our elementary school. So I was knowledgeable about Gandhi because it was the part of the, well, communist, socialist propaganda in the school. And this is where we learn how he bravely led the movement which kicked out the evil Brits. 
later we understood everything about the struggle and stuff. Uh, one thing which was particularly great with him was that he was building from small victories. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, this is the grand lesson for everybody who tries to fight the government or the evil neighbors who can't collect the dog's poop, which is the big struggle I have now in my life with a little <laughs> strollers and eight-month-year-old kid. This is the, these, these people are persistent enemies. <laughs> Don't laugh. It's tougher. But the, the point with Gandhi was like, you know, he was capable of building of the small victories. And in, so when you, when you look at his big thing was salt march. The way he picked a strategy for the salt march and the way he established something which we now teach in our workshops and in universities, like dilemma actions. Okay, everybody needs salt. It is so uh, uh, nasty from Brits that they, you know, try to tax salt in a country with 4.5 thousand lines of the, of, the, of the shore where everybody can make the salt. And picking up this thing was like going there from 70 people to 40,000. Well, that looks impressive in the movie. But doing some, something everybody can do. And I think the, the, the cleverness of his movement was picking the battles he can win. Mm -hmm. and, I, and proclaiming the victory and getting the hell out of there. Mm -hmm. So it's not like, you know, you bring 10,000 people and stay there forever, yeah. which is what Occupy movements do too often. They're so happy and exciting, the numbers are there. But what's your next thing? What's your next thing? So building from there and putting the Brits between the rock, which was, let's leave this guy make salt, we don't care. Mm -hmm. And then everybody starts making salt. And then the whole salt monopoly breaks down. And then let's arrest this guy and make him a hero. So, you know, whatever you would do, you would make a mistake. That was a move of the great yeah. strategist, and that was one of the things he was particularly clever with. But you, you talk in the book, it's quite interesting, because you kind of criticize or, or uh, challenge in, in two directions. Because on the one hand, you look at cases where people have walked away too soon and said, oh, great, we've won, and they oh, Egypt, haven't yes. really. And, and Egypt, obviously, is one case. There are, there are many others that do some. And then you take the other in the, sh of the, the spectrum, you take China, and your argument there is that by wanting everything, they in effect got nothing with Tiananmen Square and the massacre in 1989, a bit like the fairy tale where the fisherman is offered this and that and that and that and that, and then wants too much and ends mm. up going back to, to nothing. So isn't that a slightly unfair that like you're, you're, you're in a sense saying that both ways is... Uh, well, one of the, the ones like the, 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 it is, as I said, it's very difficult to give the blueprint. And as you said, the, the, the easiest way to imagine this type of struggle is as a video game. How many of you play video games? Video games. Yeah. Wrong audience. Oh. <laughs> and they're quite oh, honest usually. Oh, come on. Wow. <laughs> oh, well, yeah, there is the guy. Okay, do you know how they work? They work on levels. So it's like uh, you defeat one level of enemies and then you go to another level and the enemies are well armed or faster or nastier or they throw bombs or you get zombies or whatever. And then the next level and then the next level. It's like the non-violent struggle is very much like stairs. And the problem we see is that we see only the game over. This is like going to the you know, Shakespeare theater and seeing only the last stage and say, oh wow, this was a very happy you know, theater act or this was very sad theater act, but you don't see what happens behind. And, you know, recognizing the momentum is very important. And nonviolent struggle is very much about understanding what, what, what is the right momentum and go build for it. And then understanding that, you know, it's like there is a next step and a next step. And like in the case of Tiananmen, it was it was compelling story. There is a Chinese exile guy I met in New York over the worst coffee that I had in my life. And he told me that he was in a student leadership in fact, he was in charge for being a DJ on a school. It's really tremendous person. And this guy told me, it's like, we were negotiating generals, and there were like five out of 10 generals, top generals of Chinese army were ready to shift sides. And we thought we were winning. And instead of accepting, you know, what the government was proposing to us, we wanted to stay there one more uh, minute longer. And, and I think recognizing the moment to proclaim the victory, proclaiming can you imagine the Tiananmen if they were, you know, if they got 50% of they wanted in 1989 and went home without anybody being slaughtered? China would probably now be the completely different place. Mm -hmm. But not recognizing the momentum and wanting too much, I mean, it's a, it's a mistake the movements make. And, and I, I can understand that. I was on the street and there is a, 
there is a little list of things which is far more seductive than you know being on the street and you know having tens of thousands of people around you but then occasionally you need a strategy to turn it into a long-term victory and you always need to ask yourself okay why i'm here what do i want to achieve yeah so it's like sometimes it's difficult to recognize the momentum but it's it's what makes the genius of these successful moments yeah. right clearly planning is incredibly important and i think it was interesting i was living in Poland in 1980 when Solidarity first happened, in a way there was a lot of foundations for what mm -hmm. happened in 1980, but actually what happened day by day, there were, qu yes. there were quite a lot of random bits. That, but one of the comparisons with what you're saying is interesting, they used the word, or it was used about them, and they then used it themselves, of the self-limiting revolution, that no one would have dreamed of saying we want to get rid of the communist regime. It would have been uh -huh. utterly crazy. They merely wanted certain rights, which included the independent trade union, which became the Trojan horse, in effect, for of an opposition. But they never called it an opposition until basically eight years later, by which mm. time there were different possibilities. Well, one of, the, one, of the, one of the very interesting things in, in that type of struggle is that they were putting a finger on something people can, can rely to. And it's like not too many people will get into the crazy struggle, like, let's bring the government down. It's like, I'm, am I really into bringing the government down? But if you're giving them kind of tangible goal, and there is the story of the of the Harvey Milk, and how many people are watching this movie, Harvey Milk? Yeah, okay. Welcome to Great Britain. <laughs> it would be very different in America. Nobody would watch it, even if this is their own history. And, uh, you know, his first, you know, he was one of us. He was the Hobbit. He was the camera shop owner. He didn't have the real political experience. And when you watch this movie, you see his development from somebody who is really activist, running around, looking like a queer queen, spreading leaflets, soapbox preaching, being so damn annoying. I would never join him. It's like from the beginning of the movie, if he would be approach me, I would say, come on, go away. I don't have time for you. But soon, you know, he went on the elections, he lost. Then he tried to concentrate the gay vote in San Francisco, which was a kind of technical understanding of the politics. He lost. It was when he understood that he needs to listen to the common people and to build his campaign around a completely different topic. And then he says, this is not about the gay rights. This is whether I'm gay or straight, I'm the person who is going to, you know, make you free of the dog's poop. So basically his big crusade was cleaning the streets of the San Francisco and he got elected. And the next is victory. Well, recognizing this type of stuff requires listening. And this is very, very underestimated skills. Unfortunately, uh, people who are into activism and who are into leadership, they feel so damn confident. They'll go around and tell you what your vision of tomorrow is instead of listening to the people. By listening to the people, you can understand what's really important, but you can really build numbers because the numbers are not, never really on the far left, really on the far right. The numbers are far more in the middle of whatever topic. And if you want to bring these people, you need to listen to them. You're quite scathing, I'm not sure if that's the right word or not, but you're pretty critical of Occupy and its failures. What, what do you think went wrong there? What do you think could, should have happened, and what do you think went wrong? Well, I was, I was, uh, I was blessed to be in, in teaching in Colombia when, when this thing happened, and there is a fantastic guy, he's a kind of leftist icon there, Todd Gitlin, Professor Todd Gitlin, who wrote a great book called you know, Occupy Nation. And Todd came to me one day and said, I have a group of people, you need to meet them, they're super thrilled, they, they have thousands behind them, they have skills in organizing stuff, they're true believers in justice. And I met them, and we spent like four hours together. It was like me trying to understand, to figure out what the hell is happening there. And besides their tremendous talent and tremendous passion and tremendous commitment, and the fact that we share the goal, and of course, you know, the goal is, you know, we are all 99%, so we belong to the same family of the people. It was very difficult to me to get the answer to the question, if you are the Harry Potter or the king of the day, different tomorrow. And this is what, you know, there is a great guy called Sol Alinsky, and he has a book called The Rules for Other Never Try to Organize Ever, would probably read this book. Well, Alinsky says that anger is a powerful engine for bringing people out, but anger without hope will bring you nowhere. So aside of the list of the things you know uh, that you hate, there is a list of things you know that you stand for. That was one problem, was the lack of clear, clear goal. The second problem is that uh, their decision-making process was really, really problematic for a movement. They didn't want to get organized. They, they thinking that somehow getting organized will harm the cause mm -hmm. of this struggle. Well, 
there is a bad news. You can't run the movement of 20,000 people and not being organized. This is, there is no such a magic in the world, at least not the one I'm aware of. Uh, last but not of least important is the brand. You know, it's like, remember building from the middle and getting into the social, social part of the society. You really won't build it. These people want to go and touch the rednecks in Iowa and persuade the rednecks in Iowa that, you know, getting rid of greedy banks and the Republican government was a bad, was a good idea. Uh, if you are too much relying on the people you think similarly, and we learned it from our own experience, 992, we had our own Occupy in Serbia. It was anti-war movement. We were occupying universities and all the cool people were there. All the musicians were there. All the people you would love to hang out with were there. And then, you know, two streets away, Milosevic was sending his tanks in Croatia. We were just the zoo for him. Mm -hmm. So it's like, if you are really want to limit yourself to the group of people who think the same as you, you will maybe end up being very happy throughout the day, but you will never be capable of shaking the society. And that comes to the last, it was branding. And I think if only they named their movement 99%, then you can put it on a badge, and you can put it on a badge, and she can put it on a badge. And there are 200 different things that we can do if we want to shake the greedy banks. Instead of sitting in one park or in two parks, and this brings us to this phenomenon of occupyism, because of the new media, which makes organizing so much cheaper, so much faster, Mm -hmm. We tend to think that, oh, this is what we are going to do. Let's occupy this, you know, National Press Club. Let's occupy Frontline Club. And you don't even think that you're talking about the one of the most demanding, most complicated, and most likely to fail tactics in the history of the nonviolent struggle. Because, you know, you need people who will sit there every day. You need to organize the shift where the people will go and pee the day three. Mm -hmm. How the square is going to look the day seven. And even if you have a foremost preparations in the world, and we published an article on Hong Kong, and this is tremendous preparations, great nonviolent discipline. Mm -hmm. They were recycling on the square. It was like, cool. All your opponent needs to do in this case, mainland China, they need to sit and wait. Well, if they don't fulfill your requirements, they need to sit and wait. And then your numbers dwindle. So it's like getting into this, we are making a movement out of tactic problem was also one of the things. Uh, but um, there is a tremendous potential for a social equality movement. And uh, wherever I go here in media, we are talking about this, you know, out of the systemic parties and stuff like that. And I think one of the things that the world learned from Arab Spring and the Occupy, that it is very likely that the unlikely political players and political outsiders are going to make our political scenes far more exciting place where we are talking about dictatorships or democracy. So, you know, these movements will continue to shake the world. And maybe the next guys who start on, on, on social inequality in the US wouldn't make the same mistake. You've, you've referenced The Hobbit a couple of times. Not everyone in the room will know you're obsessed with The Hobbit and Lord of the Rings. Um, no, I'm a hobbit. I'm just well disguised. <laughs> so tell us, because I think it's nice. A lot of makeup. Tell us what is. What does it mean for you? I think this is a nice uh, ad advanced question for people understanding nonviolence. How would you describe the connections between Hobbit, Lord of the Rings, and, and the nonviolence? What are the lessons there from, mm -hmm. from hobbitry to changing the world? Well, first of all, I think the, the real heroes of, of this book and real hero of social revolutions, where we are talking the gender rights or democracy across the world, are not basically people coming from Oxford and Harvard and Eton College. And when you look at these political nobodies, you understand that they are running this show. And this is where we come to Frodo Buggins, the guy who got the ring whom he didn't want, a mission that he was super afraid and uninterested to do with, and a group of the people he would never hang up to f mission with. And the guy was not a wizard, the guy didn't wear the <laughs> shiny armor. In fact, he had a big hairy legs, uh, loved to eat, loved to drink, and smoke pot. And when you look at the modern contemporary revolutionaries, a lot of are more like Frodo Baggins than like, you know, these, 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 these ideas you get from the past. Sorry, Gandhi, I, I think he, incident, he was super educated in terms of India. And I think these, these political outsiders are shaping the world because of many reasons. Uh, first, in mind, we are looking at the very boring and sclerotic mainstream politics. You want, 
do you need to come to Serbia or you have it in Great Britain? I mean, it's like the mainstream political players are so detached from the grievances of the people. And this is not the case only in dictatorships. In dictatorships, they are detached and evil. In democracies, they are detached and the people are apathetic. So, I mean, that's the main difference. And when you look at the positive social change in the last 100 years, it was done through the people like Frodo Baggins, far more than, than the people like Gandalf. And I think that's the main thing with the hobbits. I think the, the Gandalf sentence in which we say, even the smallest creature can change the destiny of the world, matches well with the biggest revelation which happens in your head, which is, yes, there is nobody else to do it. 1998, we understood the foreigners won't do it, and obsessed with bombs and ethnic stuff. Uh, opposition won't do it. They can't stand themselves sitting in the same room, and they hate each other more than they hate Milosevic. Milosevic is pretty young. He's not going to die anytime soon, maybe next 20 years. So, I mean, either we leave the country or we take the risk tomorrow, even if we don't know the way. So it was our Hobbit revelation in 1998, which brought us to victory. And I think it's, it's more or less, then we start spotting the other Hobbits doing stuff around. So it's basically Tolkien that overthrew Milosevic. In, yeah. in a very, well, it, I told you it's Brits. <laughs> it's the Brits, exactly. It's, came it's the Brits. Well done. Um, so um, thank you. Lots and lots of food for thought there and throwing it open for questions. There is a roving microphone, which you will, yeah, of course, cool. wait for. It doesn't matter if we can hear you. Those who are listening online cannot. So. Yeah. Um, th thank you very much indeed. Um, an awful lot of food for thought there. I'd just like to ask the question which you um, alluded to in the relation to the generals of Denimin Square and your points about planning, planning, planning. Um, how, um, what was the situation with the um, fall of Milosevic? Were there uh, negotiations and arrangements? Because when I was working in the UK Customs Service, two days after the fall of Milosevic, mm -hmm. I, I wrote a report saying uh, smuggling risks from Serbia will go up with the lifting of sanctions. Let's take a very close look at not just who's gone with Milosevic, but who's still, still. there, mm -hmm. because an awful lot of people were still there, and it suggested some deals have been done. Thank you. Was that, was that, a, well, the, the, that what's an, the, the an, an unfortunate, necessary evil? Yes, that's done? probably, that's probably, that's, pro that's a very good question, first of all. And, you know, when you get to the planning, it's not, just not be, I mean, you can plan some things. And generally, the strategy was, OK, we are going to take more people to vote than he can steal. So the, generally, the strategy was like, we estimated he can steal around 300,000 votes on Kosovo because the Kosovo Albanians wouldn't vote. They were boycotting elections. And you know, so we say, if we bring more people, we will defeat him. And then because he done it in 97, we knew that he's going to steal if he loses. And that's a you know, point for getting people out on the street because one of the things which happens with election fraud is that it becomes personal for a lot of people. So it's like like stealing your vote is stealing your money from the wallet. But the, the, from the very beginning, we were aware that we need to take the pillars of the regime. And uh, the thing we learned was, you know, it's like you need to pull people out of the regime. And the opposition was, was negotiating with the people in his surrounding. Uh, we were talking to the business people as well. Because you know, business people always sit on, on two chairs, <laughs> and there was a deal made with a with a part of the police, which was uh, best equipped to intervene against the demonstration. So we make sure that they don't shoot at the at the day at the day we we brought all these protesters. Uh, was it per se a good stuff? Uh, I think it was necessary because otherwise, uh, one of the things that you know people argue very much about was was indicting Milosevic with a good idea or bad. Basically, I was not super happy with this idea because, you know, if you put a cat next to the wall and there is no way out, then, of course, he will struggle with his own life or her own life. Where if they think there is a plane that will take them to Saudi Arabia, which happened to Ben Ali, they are probably less likely to order shooting into people because they still think there is a little window of opportunity. So the negotiations were there. They were done by the opposition leaders. The good part of this negotiation is that uh, the, the police and military uh, didn't intervene at the October the 5th. 
the bad part of this of this negotiations was that Kostunica saved some of these guys when he stepped in. And uh, not getting rid of the people from the security apparatus uh, fast in the process was really painful, painful thing. Because later, as they were indicted and sent to Hag, and Milosevic was sent to Hag, uh, this is where the guy who, who, who brought me to politics and was a kind of the political father to me, Zoran Džinji, the first uh, democratic prime minister of Serbia, was lord by the very people who were indicted to go to Hag once they discovered that this so it took like three years, you know, to really clean up these people. So I think it was necessary to do it, whether it was good or bad. The sad thing is that that Jinji, you know, was really standing for persuading these people not to shoot into the, 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 the demonstrators in the street, who became the victim of the same people three years afterwards. And, you know, it's like that brings us to the question of, you know, how do you do this, this transition and what are the most important pillars to do and what is too fast and too slow. And then, I mean, no means experts of the transition, but we're witnessing now in Maldives, uh, the judiciary and the police bringing down the first democratically elected president because they were not purged yeah. straight after the revolution, which is very weird parallel between Serbia and the nation, nation six hour flights from there. So I, I think it's a very good question. I don't have an answer to it though. But it's a good discussion. There's to, always to lots open. of hard challenges, aren't there? If you completely purge, then a country kind of falls apart in, in, in some respects. And if you allow too many people still in there, they're kind they of... They become the... Yes, exactly. Yes. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. I think I would strongly agree with what you said. We need the microphone. Uh, yes. Uh, thank you so Hi. much uh, for your talk this evening. My question uh, is, can non-violent protest and nationalism ever actually work together or do they ultimately destroy each other? Well, uh, uh, it depends. Just like the first thing, they, when they bring it to Harvard, they, they, first thing they teach you, this is how you answer every question, like it depends. <laughs> so this is not a phrase, it depends. Uh, uh, on one hand, it's like the, the, it is discovering the national identity often comes through the non-violent struggle. And uh, we were witnessed with a very crazy three nationalisms. Basically, what I argue with with the book was that we were far better off living in Yugoslavia. And it was a very schizophrenic situation because, you know, m m the generation of me and my wife, we grew up going to Croatian Sea. And then when you were 18, somebody sends you to military to kill the people because they are cross really, really weird when you grew up in a brotherhood and fraternity. This is like making you going to war with whales or whatever sheeps in Wales, but basically the, the only because they are Welsh. And, uh, but, but the question is really good. So I, first of all, I think the nonviolent struggle is really very inclusive way of doing stuff. And it was very, very instrumental in rediscovering our national identity because what Milosevic did effectively in 90, and this is something Putin is, is probably doing now very effectively in Russia. Uh, what you do is like you're boosting but you're also boosting this sense of paranoia. So everybody is against the Serbs. This is the national conspiracy to take out our lands or whatsoever is the national resources, stuff like that. So you're basically playing the game which we call the bear in front of the cave, which is like, you know, we can disagree about the stuff, but if there is a bear in front of this door, we'll find a way to cooperate till we get rid of bear. And then, you know, we can get back to our, to our argument. And I think one of the things a nonviolent struggle does effectively very good is it erases the it builds unity in a, in a very strange way because yes we needed Croats and Hungarians I'm talking about big minorities in Serbia and the Slovaks and the Bulgarians and the Roma people I'm talking about the, the this is on the list of the people who are minority in my country and of course they felt well within the movement because you know the movement was so kind of national but at the same time we were working on the rediscovering what is called the new, 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 new national identity. So, so it was rebranding what Milosevic says, you know, we don't know how to work, but we know how to fight. We said, no, 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 maybe we can work. We can do the good stuff. So now from uh, starting five wars in 10 years to being a, a brand where, where the Zimbabweans and, and Egyptians can come. So people say, why are you doing this stuff? And I say, it's because I feel so patriotic that there is somebody in Maldives who has an idea that a Serb can help him to achieve a non-violent social change. This is the best compliment to my, to my inner nationalist that I can get. And I think uh, also the goals of the movement were 
getting into the good neighborhood relationship with other nations around. So I think in our case, it was, it was really kind of curing this nationalist disease, which was throughout the Balkans. Uh, but I basically think because they're inclusive and because they're building towards the middle of any kind of group, the community and the society, it's not very likely that the, the right-wing or nationalist ideas will prevail because they always include a little smaller portion of the society, even if they're imposed on the society. So it depends. It helped us to build a whole new national identity. And it probably was an important part of, you know, waking up the Indians, for example, in the way independence struggle. There was probably a nationalist component. But, you know, I, I don't have anything particularly against the nationalism. I, 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 I have a lot of things against chauvinism, which is we hate others, not we are proud that we are whatsoever we are, Serbs, Indians, Brits. So I, I, I don't think any context it has of course been a resistance against the colonial or imperial mm -hmm. rule in a sense like here mm -hmm. is my identity rather than the other person who is trying to rule but it me. helped a lot of these a lot of these struggles i mean look at the yeah. polls exactly. it helped yeah. polls you know it's like all, when you look at these struggles there are researchers looking on how this nonviolent movement helped <laughs> rebrand you as a nation you know because you kind of you speak with egyptians and you speak with arabs and they say okay i went to tahrir and immediately i discovered the whole new egypt which i didn't even know it's there. So I felt more patriotic than listening to my anthem or watching to the flag. So there is this very, very strange and very exciting uh, uh, mental thing which happens to you when you participate in this type of struggle. Next question. Yeah. Yes, I have a question about uh, foreign manipulation and in particular the American uh, manipulation and the uh, political process in different countries. And you know, there's the various agencies in the United States, the National Endowment for Democracy and a whole uh, acronym soup of other organizations have created a uh, political manipulation uh, industry. You know, part of it is uh, human rights, part of it is, um, you know, mm. human rights, uh, 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 nonviolent resistance also. And uh, so, you know, I, uh, you know, there are, that raises some legitimate questions about, you know, some of these color-coded, um, re so-called re uh, color-coded revolution. And in particular, I would like you to address, you know, what happened in Ukraine, you know, where the Americans admitted that they had put in five billion dollars, you know, to manipulate the political process. Well, first of all, I, this is, again, the overestimating the role is, is uh, a bad thing as well as underestimating. There is an, there is an industry of, a, of, a, of a democracy promotion, but from my experience, I don't find it uh, particularly creative or particularly effective. As uh, especially in the last few years, uh, they seem to lost the propaganda war against Russia today and similar media outlets. So, I mean, we can see this type of war of ideas and war of organizations in a, in a, in a both sides of the spectrum. Once again, I highly disbelieve that the money itself will make you change. You know, we, we, it was, it was uh, not before we reached tens of thousands of people in late 90s when the West really came to idea that, you know, they should fund stuff. And they were things which they were funding, which were super useful, like funding independent radio stations, which was giving people voice to get, you know, the information over the state TV. There were things which were ridiculous, which they were try, which they were trying to fund. So it's like a, looking at these development agencies, you can say, yes, the big money is there, but when you spend this money on whether this create any change on the on the on the battlefield it's very discutable uh, I I don't think the the any kind of political change imposed from the outside when it comes to the nonviolent struggle yes you can bomb the country yes you can smack somebody's army but you know believing that uh, somebody sitting in NAD can understand and seduce thousands of uh, Ukrainians who are very happy with the Yanukovych government in order to protest and having no idea that it is maybe a very highly corrupted country where people live on $50 a day and the president lives with 500 that really pisses them off. So it's like, you know, it's like when you're looking at this kind of stuff, 
you can always look and say, okay, they spent five billions wherever. Well, I mean, they, they spent billions in many different places, but they didn't really, really achieve the durable change. And uh, plus, uh, the, the probably what they, what they spend on democracy doesn't outmatch one day of money they spend on bombing. And bombing doesn't bring a durable change. So, you know, if you have a money and a wish to change stuff, this is not how these things are going. You need to find the... All of this struggle should be indigenous because uh, there is no way the millions of Ukrainians will follow the agenda somebody else imposes on them. And I know them because I know, I know a lot of Ukrainians. And we've been, we've been meeting some of them prior to the Orange Revolution. And it was their genuine anger about the elections which were, which were disputed and stolen and the fact that the presidential candidate was poisoned. And that was no manipulation. The guy was really looking bad and dying and won the elections. And then it was their genuine mistake to put too much love in the new elites. Because it's like one part of the book is called uh, Finish What You Start. And as easy as you can say, okay, Egyptians were, you know, very fast to proclaim the victory to early in protest, you can see another problem, which is like the Ukraine was too happy to put the love in the new elites, and then they split apart. So, so they, they did the thing again. But overall, I, 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 I wouldn't be very help, hopeful that any kind of, of international democracy promotion agency will be crucial in bringing about a durable change if the people on the ground don't share the vision and the ideas and the commitment to make that change. Thank you. Over here, sir. Yes, so maybe uh, uh, you can hear me, right? Yes. Yeah. I may be here in a minority of one. I'm Misha Gavrilovic, uh, born in Belgrade, defined as the only capital in the world that has been bombed by both NATO and the Nazis. Uh, this talk of non-violence is very interesting. Can I just point out that 19 NATO states, including the United Kingdom of Great Britain of uh, Northern Ireland, have dropped the equivalent of 23,000 tons of bombs on Serbia and its people. That they have bombed schools and hospitals. That they have targeted, in the middle of Belgrade, the central television station radio television Serbia and plane murdered 16 media workers. When we speak about Putin, note that Putin hasn't dropped a single bomb on the Crimea or on the Ukraine or on the Balkans. And if we speak about Otpor now, you know, and how independent they are. Can I ask you for, a, a, for a question, yeah? We're, this, we're, looking, well, for a, we're okay, looking for a question. Okay, because there will we be get, time for drinks fine, after. We get the CNN version of history. Can I just take one here? Uh, after fifth, this is published in this year, I notice. You've got here that Otpa had overthrown the dictator, keyword, Slobodan Milosevic, and established democracy in Serbia. Democracy. Mm -hmm. uh, interesting. Is Mr. Milosevic a dictator, and what is your definition of a dictator? As far as I know, Mr. Milosevic has been four and a half years in The Hague when he has to face 297 witnesses and he has brought 91 defense witnesses of his own okay so have sir, any sir. one of those proven that he is a dictator he showed that he had every time observed the Yugoslav constitution by contrast the 1980 countries have flagrantly okay. Okay, broken the UN is resolution Serge, is he a dictator and if so is he a dictator and if so why well, I always get, I always love, I always dead. love this this thing because when you read this book, you will understand that it was my mother sitting in this TV building, and I don't know where you were at the night of March, when NATO bomb hit the TV building. Was you here? Was you paying? Uh, no, was was you paying? You were in Belgrade. in Belgrade. Okay, so we were there together, and it was my mother sitting in the in the TV building. So I'm quite aware and quite critical about. Uh, stupidity and atrocity of NATO bombing plus inefficiency in bringing Milosevic down. That, however, doesn't mean that the person who stole elections in 96-97 and stole them back in uh, 2000, uh, the person who killed the main editor-in-chief of the biggest Serbian opposition and attempted to kill two opposition leaders and the person who arrested 2.5 thousand of youth activists claiming that they are terrorists, including myself, was not a dictator. The fact that he ended up in Hague was not related to his dictatorship. 
to what he was doing to others in Bosnia and Croatia. I'm super pissed on Hag, uh, both on the fact that he died there unconvicted, uh, but and more obsessed with the very idea that we couldn't trial this guy, which I think it would be the justice. And I mean, my problem with Milosevic is with what he was dealing with, with Serbs. And with Serbs, you can tell, okay, he came as a super popular leader to power at 999. He lost his majority in the parliament in 993 already, but then using different mechanic and engineering to stay there. And then, you know, when he lost the first elections in 97, he started cheating. So up to 97, he wasn't really a dictator. But after 997, you know, when you steal elections to stay in power, how do you... And I mean, I, I don't have a definition of dictatorship and democracy. I would say that there are two types of countries in this world. In one type of the country, people are afraid of their government. And in another type of country, governments are afraid of the people. And I would prefer living and, and working in, in the second one. And yes, Serbia is now the country where the government is afraid of people. And it is chosen in a free and fair elections like five years in a row already. Am I happy with the Serbian government? No, I'm not. Did I vote for the actual Serbian president? No, I didn't. But he is elected, and I need to respect that. Thank you. Next Avram Balabanovic, I'm on completely opposite side to my predecessor. I actively supported your movement in the 90s. I'm very proud that I've done that. Um, but the, there was one thing that always um, uh, confused me, but leaving in London rather than in Belgrade or in Serbia. Why, was, why did you have this negative image in Serbia after the 2000, that you were exponents of the West, that uh, um, you, you were implanted uh, into Serbian society? And, and indeed, I think someone earlier made a question, how did, you, how did you support yourself other than from imperialist American money? <laughs> Well, the, 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 it is a really interesting question, and I don't know, this is, this, I can be very critical of my own people, which is always very easy. And because I live there, and my wife lives there, and my kid lives there, I still think it's a country worth living in. And, uh, and uh, when it comes to the image, I think that basically the Serbs are very good in celebrating the big defeats of the past. And if you go to the common Serb on the street and ask him or her, uh, when was the Kosovo battle, which was the day when we lost to the Turkish Ottoman Empire? Everybody is going to say it was, we'd have done 1389. And when you ask the same person, on when the hell we got rid of these damn Turks who occupied us for 400 years? Nobody knows. Because that day is not celebrated in my country. So there is a trend in Serbia, which I really strongly disagree with, but I must admit it exists, that, you know, everybody marks a day of the NATO bombing, for example. Everybody marks, you know, everybody know when the April the 6th is, that was the day when the Nazis bombed Belgrade in 1945. It was a recently an anniversary. But nobody really celebrates 20th of October, 1945, when we got rid of Nazi Germany. So we tend to look at the defeats in our past, and we tend to be very suspicious about the good things we've done. And, you know, it's like when you throw the debate about the anti-fascist movement in Serbia, you now have people who stand for, you know, Chetniks and partisans, these are communists and basically right-wing people who were fighting Hitler. And when you sit with these people and say, are you nuts? We should be proud on the fact that we fought Hitler, rather than ending in this, this crazy debates. They, they, they are, they just don't believe in the good things they do in their history. And I think October the 5th is no incident in it. It's, it comes in the same pot where we are going to celebrate defeats and don't really believe that we have done something successful. So I think that's, that's, uh, it's easier for Serbs to believe that the revolution wasn't brought out by Serbs, by, you know, it was imported. It is just in our little way of thinking that we say, okay, you know, we could never do that, it must be somebody else. But this is the way to throw out the responsibility and this, unfortunately, the part of the mentality. I support myself from uh, three different sources. One, I, I, I give speeches and teach at universities, including NYU, Essex, and Harvard, and I get paid for this, of course. I don't do this for peanuts. 
and, uh, and the second I'm running an NGO, which is five people strong, uh, has a relatively small office in Belgrade, and it is mainly funded by my partner in, in this and the president of Canvas, whose name is Slobo Ginovic. He's owning the second biggest Serbian telecom company. So the money is coming from Serbia, though you can say that's an evil capitalist money because <laughs> people pay their phone bills. <laughs> but, but, you know, he has 300 employees, so, you know, funding our five employees, it's not, it's not a big deal. When it comes to the groups, we partner, and we have a list of probably 50 organizations, some of which you will expect to see. They're coming from a democracy promotion world, things like Freedom House, some of which are completely clear screen. Like, you know, I was participating in a UNDP workshop in Colombia, helping people to get rid of the stupid idea that the only way to fight FARC is military. So it's like uh, there are a lot of workshops around the world with us, but we never get funded by these guys. We go there, they pay for expenses, we do the gig, and then, you know, we go, we go back home. Uh, uh, basic funding comes from private sources. The biggest private funder is the guy I know for like 15 years now. And yes, he's a capitalist, but I wouldn't really call him an imperialist. He's more left-leaning guy. You. We've got one question there, but actually I will throw in, you were uh -huh. talking about the, the, the going to do the, the, the gigs, as you put it. What's the most satisfying, is the one that sticks out in your mind of being satisfying through what was achieved either at the time or achieved later from all the ones you've done? Because you've been in a lot of different places. Well, it's really, it's really, it's really interesting question. And when you go, when you go through the book and see of the, all of these examples, and, and I think like some of them are particularly appealing, some of them are particularly successful, some of them are particularly unsuccessful. I would rather speak with what time, what I feel bad about. And I really feel bad about that we all get thrilled and all get super focused on this part where we are, you know, building a movement and getting rid of the bad guy. And then we are not focused enough on day after. And I think the big challenge for us as, uh, as people who believe in, in democracy and human rights and whatever, uh, a, a kind of equality in the future, is understand how to follow up the successful social change with durability. Mm -hmm. Where we are talking about the getting rid of Mubarak's of this world, where we don't see the institutional building and we don't see the progress in you know, making this durable, where we are talking about, you know, the gay rights. It's like I'm living in a country which is very, very intolerant to LGBT population. So it's like there is a new struggle mm -hmm. coming out. But overall, it's like, uh, in my point of view, I think uh, finishing what you start and adding a and understanding transition and really going to this, to this world of uh, USADs, NADs, or whatever is Westminster Foundation here in Great Britain, and sitting with these guys and say, okay, what have you been spending your money to in the last 10 years? And then, you know, go through the institutional building stuff and say, okay, these are the lessons we want to learn. It's like one of the particularly painful thing, and, you know, it's in the title of the book, and it's a great struggle, and people with Maldives. Okay, this is tiny island nation. It was the part of the Commonwealth. It's not anymore. You can't invade it anymore. But basically, it's like... 300,000 people, super effective movement, the great, super brave guy who became the world champion of climate changes because the Maldives are the first country to sink with the, with the turn of the tide, Mohamed Nashidani, very, very swift transition, 100% Muslim nation. And then he got ousted after three years. Why? Because they were too little to care. And I think if only we help them build a durable democracy, we would be ready for Tunisia. Because this happened in 2008. So learning from our own mistakes by supporting these people in the transition phase, and this is no way I'm an expert in this. I'm a graduated biologist. I know I, I will tell you everything about the pikes and perches and stuff like that. But there are so many people in this, in this transition industry which should be, should be focused on helping these things. So unlike saying what I'm partly proud of, I'm very unproud of we, how do we follow up. Okay. Thank you. So. Um, is it, can you hear me? Yes. Um, I f sort of feel like my question has already been asked, but um, I'm asking in a more abstract sense perhaps. Um, you've talked about Gandhi and you've talked about uh, the Lord of the Rings. They, they differ in an important way. Gandhi was a very realist 
and Lord of the Rings is, you know, very absolutist, mm. uh, black and white, evil, good conflict. Um, and so I'm wondering what would you say about, is there a role in demonizing the, you know, the people that you're opposing or the regime you're opposing? Um, or do you see revolutionaries as coming in sort of after the point where the people are already perceived as complete demons anyway? Um, I guess that's my question. It's a very interesting question, and I think uh, too often people get, uh, get uh, excited about demonizing because, you know, it's, it's so easy if I hate you, and it's also so thrilling, and, you know, in the end then you can put a person or a system or a political party in the center of evil and build your own reality around it. But what we learned and what we try to teach groups is actually to think in a completely different way because the main difference between the violent and nonviolent struggle, and this is now science talking, uh, is in a direction. In the violent struggle you push, whether you're throwing stones or you're sending tanks, in nonviolent struggle we pull. So you really want to pull people to step out of the system. And of course, you can't accommodate or convert somebody you try to kill. So it's like, uh, when it comes to this, the first thing you do is like, what is my spectrum of allies? OK, you and me, we are standing for a goal. We are super happy in getting rid of this dictator in this neighborhood. So you try to draw the spectrum of the allies from us to Steve to see why the people would support us and why would they support Steve and to look at their motivations and try to speak with them because what you want is pulling them. I'll give you the very practical example. Serbs never read books. They, we hate learning from books because we think we are the best improvisers in the world, which we of course are. <laughs> so I'm, 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 but you know, it took us eight years for this and we started 1991, 92, when we were facing the police force, and they were looking nasty, and they were, you know, bringing all of these shields, and they were looking like stormtroopers, basically, from Star Wars. And uh, when you would see a police ranks, you would start to howl. Like, up, 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 was, uh, you know, that was a message to them that they are basically no be better than dogs. And, of course, they were beating us with an appetite, because this is you know, the social distance. And then we evolved into the situation in which we were, instead of that, bringing them flowers and cakes. And when we see them, we would use Plavi, Plavi, which is like the Serbian soccer team, which sucks, wears the blue dresses. So it's like when you say blue guys, blue guys, this is how you would support your own national team. So it immediately brings these people differently. Of course, you can't pull out all of the people. But if you need to alienate individuals who really commit horrible crimes and who are really beating activists and doing this with appetites, you want to personalize this. And this is called naming and shaming. So you name and shame individuals, but you're very aware of the fact that, you know, there is always be somebody need to serve and to protect. So you don't really want to bring these institutions down. You want to really persuade to talk to the police and say, okay, wouldn't you rather serve and protect the people than one corrupted, you know, Steve Crush or wh whoever sits on the top. So it's like demonizing is a kind of a, of a nice, but one of the reasons I don't believe in, in, in this conflict situation is that uh, if you don't just pull these people out, it's very difficult to build without them. You go into the disintegration phase. And when you are into the disintegration phase, it's not very likely that you will be capable to build from the scratch. So it's like, from my point of view, it's like, uh, yes, of course, naming and shaming people who do horrible things is useful, but still talking to the people from the pillars and finding those who are professionals. And I recently was, was, was doing like this, this ridiculous conversation with some of my students from Venezuela. They say, oh, you know, it's like they can't even agree of whom of the opposition leaders to support. And I said, you will need all the opposition leaders and you will need all the Chavistas who are not corrupted and you will need 300,000 people who left the country if you want to save this ship. And this is the unity you want to build. And instead of fighting against this guy and that guy and that guy, which is super thrilling and making you being right, try being strategic instead of being right. And this is a completely different point of view. And that you described earlier the kind of the cracks in the iceberg, which becomes so important with the police 
stepping back on the final day mm. in, in Belgrade. And of course, we've seen that again and again in the in the Ukraine context. There were some wonderful actions, which I think may have happened in Belgrade, but I'm not sure. But in Kiev, some may have seen during the, the peaceful bit of Euromaidan before it all went so horribly wrong, but where mirrors, old ladies especially, but others mm. as well, would hold up mirrors to the young policemen, oh. basically saying, this is, you could be my son, you could be my grandson. Mm. And, and that sense of reflect upon yourself mm. had, had very, very powerful impact. Um, we have one over here, exactly, and a couple more if we have time, but you, please. Yeah, um, I'm really interested in what you've written in the past about laughterism and what you've said tonight. Um, could you briefly go into why you think that humour works and whether you think that its success is limited to oppressive contexts, mm. whether it could be used as a tactic in other social movements, say, in this country? Mm. Okay, the, the, we were obsessed with laughterism because A, Serbs are never serious and B, we think we know how to tell jokes very well. And uh, C, we grew up on a Monty Python type of humor and we are very politically incorrect and we love teasing stuff and it's like this is what we really are thrilled about. And you know, you never take Serb too seriously. And uh, the point here is like, uh, when you look at why it works with us, it worked because I thought it works because it's a kind of mentality thing. And because we were so happy in teasing people, it's like, but when you got the scientific look, and it's like I wrote several articles, I, I did a TED talk on, on, on laughterism, TEDx talk. And I was looking at the researching this, and there is, a, there is a guy who wrote the book who knows far better than me about this kind of stuff. But I we want to look at the three different type of thing. First, uh, humor is a fear breaker. And if you still get back to the idea of the video game, and if you look at the status quo force in the society, these are either fear in the dictatorship or apathy in Great Britain. Uh, where if you look at the, the game changing, it's enthusiasm and social mobilization and commitment. So if you see one thing going up, and second thing going down, you can kind of predict of how this level of the video game will end. Uh, humor breaks fear. It's a human nature. And if you're preparing for a, a operation on your, on your heart, the last thing you want to hear is, okay, this is what is going to happen. They're going to put you under the, the, the anesthesia. They're going to put you on a table. They're going to open chest. Then they're going to take the rib. So you're not listening already, okay? Where if somebody cracks a joke, the fear disappears. It's an it's a adrenaline effect. It's a physiology. And then second, more important thing, uh, when you think what movements, what makes movements uh, attractive for the people, it's the same thing that you have in your own community. And when you put the finger on your, on your forehead and think who is the most attractive people in my environment? And is it the tallest one, the most clever one, the one with the best suit? or with most expensive watch, uh, you will end up by, by understanding that it's a funny guy. And because the funny guys and girls are natural attraction to others, this is why the funny movements are the national attraction to others. So the cool factor that you add to the movement really make people want to join, because most of the activist thing is, you remember, so boring. We don't want to do this. But if this is so cool, and I was watching, I mean, even the Top Gun journalists don't understand this. It's like you were watching a seventh or tenth day of Egypt, and there is somebody sitting on a CNN, and say, now the regime needs to sit back and wait for the people to lose. And we are talking about the 300,000 people party in the teenagers, where they're going every night and have fun. Whoever think this is going to disappear have never met a teenager. <laughs> it doesn't need to do anything with understanding of the Middle East. Last but not of least importance, there are leaders, not all of them, I will make an exception later. The real problem with people in power is that after a certain number of years, they start taking themselves <laughs> too seriously. Whether democratically elected or came on power by coup d'etat or however, they see too much of themselves in the newspaper, on the billboards, on the TV, and they start believing this image. So if you tease them a little bit, they get angry, and then they do stupid stuff. So laftivism, as a definition, has nothing to do with a political satire. Laftivism is intentional use of mocking to put your opponent between the rock, 
So if he leaves the barrel with his face staying on the street, then people will understand that they can do it. And everybody was going to do the toy protest. And if they arrest the barrel or ban the toy protest, then they look as an idiot. So it's like banning a toy protest from Putin, the guy who invests so much into his shirtless look and wrestling tigers and saving dolphins from drowning, sends basically a message that toys. So it's like the, the, when you look at the loftivism part, what is really interesting, it has a three completely, it operates on three completely different level. As a free breaker, which is probably physiology, uh, as a cool factor which brings more people and as a, as a teaser to your opponent to do a kind, it puts him or her between the rock and the hard place. I'll give you the two examples where some of them survive, like George W. Bush, one of the most unpopular uh, presidents in the history, was kind of Teflon on jokes. So he had the mentality in which you throw a stupid Texan cowboy kind of stuff at him and he appears with a hat day after and gets away with it. And there is a, one of my most beloved protests happened in Montenegro, which is in fact a neighboring country to Serbia. Uh, and and it's, a, it's not a dictatorship, it's a kind of democracy. But you know, people got, got pre prime minister buying his underwear by the credit card from the government. Okay, so that was not... And then they came out with the idea that the people will be donating the pairs of panties. <laughs> to the ministers. And then, of course, the, the, there is this, and there are big ministers, so they were big panties, and the female ministers, so they had tong panties, and all this kind of stuff. And there are thousands of panties were donated. And I know the girl who done it. She's, she's, she's one of the most brave activists in the Balkans, Vanya Chatovic. And then Prime Minister Igor Lupšić, who is a very intelligent young guy, he stepped out, he hugged her in front of the camera, and he told her, you really caught me. So that was the only survival. If only police appeared and start cleaning this, that would be, he would go under the ice. But it's like, also, it's also the way how they deal with this kind of stuff. And necessarily only the autocrats who react with allergy, a lot of democratically elected politicians can stand being mocked. Thank you. We're almost at a week. Yeah, one oh, more quick one, maybe, in the back. Yeah. Um, Hi, this. So you obviously know your way around a revolution. Um, how would you advise? I don't even know if there is a cohesive North Korean resistance movement or not. Probably not. How would you advise, if there was, how would you advise the leader uh, of that movement to um, obviously, you know, reconcile democracy with North Korea? And, um, you know, how would you resolve that, that nation? Well, re <laughs> okay. Uh, I don't have a clue how to resolve the nation, but I, I'm talking to some very clever North Koreans who are exiled. So I, I never met the people from inside the country, but the Seoul and, and other places in South Korea are full of the, of, the, of the deflectors. And one of the things I've learned from the deflectors that the 85% of the people who deflected North Korea have been watching the South Korean soap operas before they deflected. That tells you a story about how breaking this blurb of misinformation is important in getting these people the very idea that there is a whole world out there where you know people can live can live different life. I think the existing tactics on opposing Kim Jong Un uh, are not really effective. Where we are talking about the hacking or international isolation, I don't believe in broad sanctions because I was living in a country which was under the broad sanctions, and it was only the regime benefiting from the broad sanctions, while my father, who was a kind of the middle-aged, middle, middle-class guy, ended up losing everything and selling petrol on the street. Because somebody get the genius idea, if we only stop the petrol getting into Serbia, we'll stop Milosevic tanks in Bosnia. Well, they didn't. <coughs> they concentrated smuggling. It became the, the business. Uh, North Korea, is particularly interested is what you get with talking to these people is that the main uh, status quo power in the society is very high atomization. And I think if you can imagine, if you would have a you know, magic wand and go there and meet with 10 people, and if you can tell them, forget the Kim Jong-un, let's look at your neighborhood. Uh, 
your building is probably falling apart, there is no heating, your streets are full of potholes, because majority of these regimes, and North Korea is probably the worst example, they don't deliver. So if you can build a community movement of the people around the things that the state does not deliver, where this is, you know, the clean street or the public transportation or heating in the buildings, you would be capable in turning people from getting up and down into watching into each other. So when you look at the strategic level, you will look at the non-political space because A, it's less risky and B, it's more likely to produce some kind of positive answer from the government. And if you look at the tactics, you would look at the low-risk tactics in mobilizing people in fixing communal problem. I, I know it doesn't sound like, like, uh, like a very sexy thing to do, but in my deep understanding of, of, of this society, uh, which, is, which is by knowing some people from there, I'm not, uh, in no means expert in North Korea, I think building the confidence in the fact that people can organize and do small things would be far more damaging to the regime than organizing a large demonstrations and getting yourself killed. That's my, my private opinion. It's probably not a good recipe. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed. Thank you to the Frontline Club for hosting this. Thank you to you guys. And above all, Serdar, Bob, thanks so much. Thank you very much indeed. A, rem a reminder also that there are lots of copies of Serge's wonderful book on the table here, and he has promised that he's going to sit or stand some, there yes. and doing lots of signing. Thank you very much to all.